When it comes to bridges, I've been a bit of a fan and a nerd for as long as I can remember, so it was probably inevitable that I would start an occasional series looking at Bristol's bridges. The eponymous one, or the really famous one, would probably have been the obvious places to start, but instead I'll kick off with Bristol's other suspension bridges. Starting here at Jail Ferry Bridge, which connects Wapping Wharf on Spike Island, with the suburbs south of the New Cut, Bedminster and Southville. It was opened in 1935 at a cost of £2,600, built to a design by David Rowell & Co, a London company, by John Lysart, a local steel and iron firm founded in 1856. Lysart's main ironworks in Bristol was here, St Vincent's Works. By the 1880s he was employing 400 men and had expanded to Australia. This 1891 head office was built for him by his architect's brother, Thomas Lysart, whose name you might remember if you watched my first ever video on Bristol Byzantine. Amongst many other things, in many other places around the country, and indeed around the world, John Lysart's firm also built the Great Western Railway's Bristol Goodshed and Vauxhall Bridge. Back to Jail Ferry Bridge though, which was supposed to be called Southville Bridge after the suburb it serves, but inevitably got named after the ferry it replaced. Actual photos of the ferry are hard to come by, at least without a licensing budget that I don't have. But I have scraped together this. Although the boat itself is mostly out of frame, you can clearly see the ramps down to the ferry, which just about survived to this day, although not in a state that would pass muster for modern health and safety concerns. You can also see how Coronation Road here used to be Coronation Bridge, making the ferry accessible via a lane through to Ackermans Road, which I can only assume is named after John Ackerman, the Bristol shipbuilding big shot who established the ferry in 1829. This link is now blocked up. With this stretch of the new cut seeing extremely variable levels and strong currents in both directions depending on the tide, it must have been a pretty skilled bunch of boatmen working the surprisingly small watercraft. Still, at the time it was replaced by the bridge, the ferry had been running continuously for over a century, and was transporting some 10,000 people per month. Funnily enough, just as the supposed Southfield Bridge became Jail Ferry Bridge, the Jail Ferry itself was supposed to have been the Coronation Ferry, but instead locals named it after the Bristol New Jail, which opened in 1820 on Spike Island, was destroyed by riots in 1831, rebuilt and eventually demolished in 1898, except for one stretch of wall and the gatehouse which you can see here today. Back to the Jail Ferry Bridge though, the book From Brigstow to Bristol in 45 Bridges describes these spires as echoing the tower of nearby St Paul's Southville. I suspect this is complete coincidence however because David Rowell & Co. designed numerous other similar bridges elsewhere in England, Wales, Ireland, even New Zealand and Patagonia, Chile, and of these, several of them share the pointy decorations and are definitely nowhere near St Paul's Southville. As a self-declared bridge fan and purveyor of ooh, isn't that historic infrastructure pretty and interesting type of YouTube content, you might very well expect me to agree with the book's description of this bridge as lovely. Truth be told though, I don't actually like it very much. To be clear, its existence is very much welcomed on a practical level, and more of that later. And visually speaking, I'll admit, the lattice of metalwork has a certain period charm. So, I don't hate it, but I can't muster much enthusiasm beyond that. I think the problem is, it simply doesn't embody my platonic ideal of a suspension bridge. Reduced to a few brush strokes, the most graceful and perhaps the most important and defining line in a suspension bridge is the catenary curve of the main cables. Here, the handrail pokes above the bottom of that curve, ruining that line. Next, I want to admire the deck flowing smoothly and seamlessly across the void, but in this case we have these awkward down-sloping ramps between the piers of the bridge and the banks of the river. OK, I'm being harsh to criticise the bridge for this because it has to handle the height difference between the two banks. It wouldn't be much use if the deck was aesthetically pleasingly level 
only to stop dead dangling three metres up in the air at the Whopping Wharf side. But I am just talking about aesthetics here, and unfortunately, these ramps are displeasing. Furthermore, a key part of the visual appeal of suspension bridges is their incredible lightness, their seemingly impossible ratio between the volume of material used and the distance spanned. Here, the busy grid of ironwork forming the side railings is rather heavy on the eye, so it's not at all in the slender ribbon category. It doesn't seem impossible that this structure can span this gap. In fact, you almost feel a truss-like iron or steel structure of that size should almost be able to bridge the gap without the suspension cables, a sense which is rather reinforced if you've ever been half a mile downstream and seen the truss Vauxhall Bridge, which basically does just that. So all of this is why, by the high standards of suspension bridges, I'm afraid that I find the Jail Ferry Bridge to be a bit of an ugly duckling. Enough history and aesthetics though, surely a bridge above all should be judged in practical terms. As I mentioned, I am of course extremely grateful for its existence and its fundamental success in, well, bridging the river at this point. Taking that ferry would have been a right faff, and the detour on foot is a significant pain in the arse as well. More on that shortly. However, if I am to judge brutally here, I think there is a case that this bridge is barely fit for purpose. Admittedly, most of my footage so far makes it look scarcely used, but that's because most of it was shot at around 7am on a Sunday morning, because I didn't want to be in hundreds of people's way. At peak times, this is a critical pedestrian cycle and scooter corridor between the city centre and the whole Southfield, Bedminster, southern suburban area. And the fact is, it's not wide enough to accommodate this demand. The capacity here is easily filled by pedestrians alone. Cyclists and scooters could easily fill the same capacity again, but instead we have this bottleneck. Officially, they should dismount, and it might seem churlish to moan about having to dismount for such a short distance, but the entire essence of cycling as an efficient mode of transport is kind of about your rolling momentum, so I think it would be unwise to dismiss how badly things like this can detract from a cyclist's experience. In itself, it might be a minor inconvenience, but once you stack umpteen locations like this along an X-mile route, then suddenly a smooth and easy 10 minute cycle becomes a 20 to 30 minute exercise in frustration and pointlessness. And this does inhibit the modal share of sustainable healthy transport choices in the long run and in the bigger picture. In my opinion, if you had a magic wand, you would want this bridge to be at least twice as wide, and that's not even being ambitiously future proof. That's just giving it the capacity to cope with today's traffic without becoming a major choke point but we're supposed to be encouraging an ever greater percentage of people towards walking and cycling. I really don't see how this bridge's current dimensions are compatible with that. But hey, it could be worse. It could be closed completely for the best part of a year. Oh. Yes, in August 2022, this bridge closed for essential maintenance. At the time of publishing this video, it is closed and is expected to remain closed for six to nine months by official proclamations, or perhaps a year or more by local cynicism. At this point, this video originally had five or six minutes of me ranting about how annoying this is, and how thoroughly detrimental it is to wider principles of healthy urbanism, and debating quotes from the mayor about it, digging into council infrastructure funding documents, and so on and so on. But I realise that probably nobody outside Bedminster will really care, and once the bridge reopens, probably nobody even in Bedminster will care. It rather derailed what was otherwise a pleasant potted history of some nice vintage bridges, so maybe after the fact I'll do a video about the refurbishment specifically, but for now, I'm going to move swiftly on to the happier matter of Jail Ferry Bridge's elder sibling. Spark Evans Park Bridge was completed in 1933, also designed by David Rowell and Co., and also built by John Mysart. It's the prettier of the two, in my opinion. It probably helps that it crosses the mostly natural River Avon here, not the man-made New Cut. The bridge has a nice magical quality as the deck emerges, floating, 
from the densely wooded riverbanks, with the anchorages, towers and rather clumsy ramp hidden from view. You might also notice that here the main cables dip down to the handrail, not beneath it, ensuring the classic teenery curve is fully visible. Overall, it just feels, to me, slightly more graceful and elegant than its younger counterpart. This bridge was built as part of various job creation schemes from the council in that era, and today it does have a slight whiff of something built for the sake of creating jobs rather than because a bridge here is desperately needed. Spark Evans Park Bridge is, amazingly enough, named after Spark Evans Park, which was in turn named after P.F. Spark Evans, a local leather industrialist turned philanthropist who donated the land for it. His obituary in the Western Daily Press said that he was a gentleman who in a quiet way was given to many good works. Although Spark Evans' tannery is long gone, this modest rectangle of green space still sits amidst an extensive sprawl of industrial urbanity. With the population of these warehouses, railway sidings, car parks and so on being essentially zero, neither the park nor the bridge are exactly overwhelmed with pedestrian traffic. There is a pocket of traditional terraced housing across the bridge, recently joined by the rather extensive paintworks regeneration, and for these residents the bridge undoubtedly provides a highly welcome connection to the park. It cannot, however, be realistically described as linking two dense and thriving neighbourhoods, and although, as the signage indicates, the riverside path on the other side continues onto the city centre, I think it's probably stretching it to say it serves a critical commuter axis. In fact, much as I hate the clickbaity trend for describing everything even slightly less than famous as hidden or secret, this is the sort of bridge that you know, a lesser kind of YouTuber might slap with that label. It has that vibe of being tucked away in something you might not realise existed, unless you happen to live locally. Even from within the namesake park, it's strangely camouflaged. In this context, I find the slightly dorky appearance, underwhelming capacity, and vintage aesthetic rather more charming than at Jail Ferry Bridge. Here at the Jail Ferry non-bridge in 2022, any charm derived from its rickety 90-year-old nature is sadly soured by the painful reality of its closure. A reminder that not only is its 90-year-old design inadequate for present or future demands, but that we have failed to even maintain that 90-year-old baseline for what is considered an acceptable provision of sustainable transport connectivity, let alone improve on it. That's pathetic, isn't it? That's a rather depressing note on which to end, but nevertheless end it there I shall. If for some strange reason you are hungry to hear more of me snarking and moaning about the suboptimal transport infrastructure of the immediate Whopping Wharf vicinity, you might enjoy my video on the regeneration of Spike Island and the metro system which never materialised. In the meantime, thanks for watching, thanks to everyone whose work I built on in making this video, and if you liked it, why not subscribe in case I make any more. Cheers!